Hey, this is Michael Emery. Thanks for tuning into the Slow Baja. This podcast is powered by Tequila Fortaleza, handmade in small batches, and hands down, my favorite tequila. You know, I've long said it, ask your doctor if Baja is right for you. Well, you got to check out the adventures tab at slowbaja.com. The Slow Baja Rally is February 23rd to March 3rd. It's a slow roll from San Diego down to Loretto and back about 10 days long. We're going to have a couple of nights laying over in Loretto. I've got some ready-made adventures for you there. Uh, If you want to get off on a one-day mule packing trip or if the weather's good and you want to get out on the water, we're going to have a one-day water adventure. Uh, There's also going to be a one-day volunteer project for folks who might want to do that. And if you got some stuff that you need to address on your your rig, well, we're going to have some hand-selected Slow Baja approved mechanics, whether you need a welder or a tire shop or a mechanic transmission, whatever it is, we're going to have uh, those resources for you. So it's going to be easy for you to get whatever you need addressed, addressed. You know, it's not the longest or the largest or the most miles. It's the slowest and the best miles and hopefully the most smiles. All right. For more information, check it out. It's a Slow Baja rally at slowbaja.com slash advance. Adventures. Don't be afraid to ask questions. You can always reach me through the contact link at slowbaja.com. Once again, that's February 23rd through March 3rd, 2024, the Slow Baja Rally. You know, I'm a minimalist when it comes to Baja travel, but the one thing I don't leave home without is a good old paper map. My favorite is the beautiful, and I mean beautiful, Baja Road and Recreation Atlas by Benchmark Maps. It's an oversized 72-page book. It's jammed with details. It brings the peninsula's rugged terrain into clear focus. Get yours at benchmarkmaps.com. In fact, get two. One for your trip planning at home and one for your Baja rig. Hey, big news. Benchmark just released the second edition of the Baja Road and Recreation Atlas. They are always striving to improve these maps, and they've added a bunch of new features, a bunch of places of interest, including the Chenith Legacy Lodge. It wasn't on the first printing of the map. It's there now. It's awesome. You can see it right there in Persibu. Get your brand new second edition of the Baja Road and Recreation Atlas from BenchmarkMaps.com. And while you're at BenchmarkMaps.com, you got to check out all their other atlases. I think they're up to 17 now, including British columbia they've got folding maps they've got digital maps they've got giant wall maps my favorite and i've got it up on my wall right here at slow baja hq is the 30 inch by 46 inch baja wall map it's so great to just look at one thing see the entire peninsula there i love it benchmarkmaps.com slow baja approved Well, hello. My heaping dose of gratitude today goes out to Bob Bauer. And in a hundred and something podcasts, I have never acknowledged the subject of my podcast as the subject of my heaping dose of gratitude. But Bob is truly a unique and amazing individual. And I just want to call Bob out for his what about you letter that he wrote, an open letter about um, reality check before crossing the border. He wrote this specifically for crews that are going to go down and chase the the Baja 1000. And we're just about at Baja 1000 time here. People are pre-running right now. The race is going to start in two weeks um, from when I'm recording this. And, you know, I I went down a couple years ago and I helped a photographer and I drove and I had two days, two all-nighters before I left. And, you know, then of course there's two all-nighters on the race. And then there's, you know, all sorts of stupid passes and not enough food and no sleep and any of that. And it's not stuff that I'm proud of, but you get caught up in the moment. And I think if you take a minute and I'll have this connected to the uh, the show notes and read Bob's letter, what about you? Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully this will save one person, one accident, one. Anyways, um, without further ado, I'm going to read a couple lines from Bob Bowers. What about you? Plan on getting to your destination late. Don't drink alcoholic stuff, period. Don't use drugs, period. Ask yourself, are we important enough to the people in the race car that they will feel good about us getting maimed trying to catch them? Ask yourself, would I do this if my kids were with me? I'm not going to read the rest of it. Check it out in the show notes. Bob Bauer. What about you? Hey, and just a quick uh, explanation about um, we come into this conversation a little hot. Uh, Getting to Bob's place in the morning, everybody in his neighborhood, it's a lovely neighborhood, 
everybody happened to be getting their lawns done or their yards done or what have you that day. So Bob, being a thoughtful fellow, asked the neighbor's yard guys to stop for a minute so we could record. And at some point, I think I muffed the recording as we went from you know, recording number six or number seven or what have you. And uh, again, we come in sort of midstream. He's relaying a story about Ivan Stewart asking some questions in the car. So without further ado, Bob Bauer on Slow Baja. Whatever we're getting out of this, we're getting out of this. Cutting clip. Ivan Stewart, yeah, questioner. So, um, what was I thinking here, Ivan? Oh, we're, he's full of questions all the time. Questions that make you really stop and think because you wonder. He's, we're driving in, in his Ford um, Ranger Toyota pre-runner thing that they've cobbled up for him. So we're going around a turn and whoo, the tire's a little, you know, he's got them lowered. And you hear the tire's go, whoo, 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 whoo. And he turns to me and he says, so Bob, he says, we can hear the tires, they're sliding. How come the tires are sliding and making noise, but I'm not sliding in the truck? Hmm. You're a tire guy. Yeah, I'm a tire guy. This is a technical question. This is a technical question, and I got to People want to know. They do want to know. <laughs> At least Ivan did. And uh, it took me years to find the answer. And then when From I From a vault in Akron, Ohio, oh. Bob Bauer. Today, yeah. on He's Got the Answer. They had, well, we had some good engineers that would trust us with, with their information. I mean, it's, it's like they'd send us out and please don't cobble it up, you know. Um, and I learned that part of the footprint is sliding. And when a tire, or you talked about your, you spent all that money for those Pirellis on your 510. <laughs> this guy pays attention. Well. 1981. Yeah. But that, I mean, the Pirelli you had there, was a, it was Pirelli, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's got a longitudinal footprint. Yeah. More like a board like this. Yeah. Um, and when it starts losing traction, it loses traction from the back of the footprint up. So as it turns like this, you're still headed this way, but this part is now sliding. This part is still turning. And, and it's those things, those back blocks going. I told him the answer. I laid it out all for him. He completely forgot that he asked the damn question. <laughs> but I learned. I figured it out. Well, it's a beautiful day in Lake Forest, California. Yes, I'm, it is. I'm with the legend Bob Bauer. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say that again because I can't say legends all the time. It inflates these guys unnecessarily. It's a beautiful day in Lake Forest, California. I'm with Bob Bauer, and we are getting down to a slow Baja conversation, and I am so excited to be here. I looked across a room at the Off-Road Motorsports Hall of Fame. I saw this magnificent beard and mustache, and I said, I don't know who that guy is. I don't know what he's done in life, but I'm going to get him on slow Baja. I know it. I know he's got a story. And here we are. Here we are. And uh, I, I must tell you that slow Baja is really the rightest answer for any question. I, and I'm not saying it just because you have a show. I, as many years as I've spent in Baja and going down and doing this and doing that and doing the other. Not always, not always racing, but sometimes just down there, you know, funning. I've said for years, Baja needs to be driven at 45 miles an hour. Windows open. All the guys that go down there at 80 miles an hour, they never smell Baja. They're missing out. There's some great exactly. aromas there. Exactly. You can smell the ocean when you're getting close. You can't see it, but you can smell the ocean. Those are things that slow Baja means to me. Aside from the fact that it's a lot safer, it's yeah. just a beautiful way to see a beautiful place. Well, let's jump right into it. What did Bobby Spears telling you slow hands, slow feet are actually <laughs> faster? What did you take away from Bill Strop's genius of the La Carrera Panamericana Lincoln strategy and the C's candy giving you a free candy when you came in. How did you mix all that up into the greatest corporate brand building, sponsor money saving strategy in the effing world? Well, listen, it's not easy being confused reprobate, I promise. <laughs> But it's, I mean, you know, that's pure genius. Break that down. Tell, t t not everybody's going to know what the heck I just well, said. Well, I'm a fan of simple. A guy named Bobby Spears was uh, one of Bill Strop's top guys. And Bill Strop was Ford Lincoln Mercury's top team for running the Carrera, uh, La Carrera Panamericana down in uh, Mexico and South America. And this is in the mid-50s. Yeah, 1950 to 1954, a 2,000-mile yes. long, high-speed, dangerous, multiple people, multiple fans got killed every year and bill strop figured it out okay take it away it was a real deal 
it was a real deal. And I remember reading stories about Strop uh, pitting his Lincoln Mercury. It's a guy named Johnny Mance. And um, instead of, you know, to service the vehicle, service the race car when it comes up, instead of putting it up on ramps and doing all like this, Strop would just have a big hole dug in the ground. Yeah, he pre-dug pits. He pre-dug pits, and the car would come in. And, and you know, I, and I'm a like a eight-year-old kid, maybe, and reading this in Motor Trend or Road and Track or one of those. Um, and I'm, my mind is going like, whoa. Well, it's stored. I thought, what an adventure, man, if I ever, <laughs> you know, if I ever. And, and so there I was in the, the Ute Road pit at the 1977 Men 400, I think it was seven. And I'd never met Bobby Spears or anybody. I was a volunteer. I was doing what I was told. Here, you go. Stand there. Get out of the sun. Get out of the shade. Whatever. And so here's Bobby Spears telling me, he says, you're going to pit. Here's your job. Your job, Bob, is you're going to hand water and a wet rag to whoever's sitting in the right seat of that race car is about to come in. Okay. And he says, and I want you to use slow hands and slow feet. He says, you'll go faster. You'll go faster. But slow hands and slow feet. He says, it'll be much quicker. And he says, when you're done, step away from and get your hands in the air. Okay. You can do that. I can do that. But what was really happening, Michael, I tell you, I, I still feel the heartbeats. While he was saying this to me, the voices in my head weren't anything to do. I was saying, this is it. This is what I'm reading. I've been reading about this for like ever. And now it's happening. It's like, holy mackerel. And when he got done doing it, he got his water. He got his wet rag. He gave the rag back. He kept the water. The truck left. And I just sort of stood there in the dust saying this. I, I got to have this for the rest of my life somehow, some way. And, and I actually, I, I kind of focused on saying, I got to find a way to keep my hand in this some way, somehow. Um, it's just, it fits. And now that it's all in the rearview mirror, I might have been close to right, I guess. Yeah. And again, so you had the guy who developed the greatest strategy for a team. And for folks who don't know the La Carrera Panama Americana, but you've been listening to Slow Baja now for 100 episodes, you know that I'm obsessed by that race, that I did the race, that it nearly cost me my marriage, that I sold my race car, and I bought the same day that I sold my race car. The next day, I bought my Land Cruiser as a great family vehicle, and I gave it to my wife as our, a Valentine's Day present that the next day. And, of course, you know, immediately I started planning to go to Baja. <laughs> Why not? So... Bill Strop really created a victory for the competitors or gave them the greatest chance ever uh, in the greatest high-speed road race ever, uh, win on Sunday, sell on Monday era. He won it all in his strategy. Mm -hmm. The drivers only drank stuff out of bottles. Mm -hmm. They only ate food that was prepared by their cooks. Mm -hmm. They had pits dug here, there, everywhere. They figured out the tires. They did all that stuff before they the race even started and so you have bobby spears telling you slow hand slow feet giving you a, a job which you took to and you listened and then you have bill strop and then sees candy and then you turned it into a corporate boondoggle <laughs> that uh, really set you set bfg up for great success and set a whole bunch of racers up for great success so take that part two tell me about sees candy and tell okay. me about how it translates into what you did well between the Bobby Spears, you know, instant, I don't know what, instant crazy for me, and the BFG pitting situation, it was a five-year period between the two. And in that five years, I found my way to get to off-road races, whether it's through work or through friends or whatever. And as, as you do, you learn about it. Michael, you find out what, what's, what's going on here, what happens. And, and I be, really became much more aware of how important the people in the pits were because I always thought it was about the, the noise-making machine. No, it's the pits. You know, man, people can win with pits or, or lose. And uh, so these were just little impressions that were sticking in my mind. And um, 1980, well, December of 81, my boss calls me into the office. It was actually Christmas Eve day. And uh, in his own unique way, ex expressed to me that I'm going to take over the off-road race program. You're going to manage that program. And pulling you off of that, this assignment, putting you on that one. And I didn't really want it. Um, I was really 
happy and excited about doing what I was doing. And and uh, the guys that went the off road races in the department, you know, were always getting free stuff and things like that. And I just never did like that idea, so I, I kind of shied away from. It, but I didn't have a choice, so I took the job, started talking to our uh, limited number of teams. I think we only had like five or six. BF Goodrich supported teams, not like you see today. Yeah, and quickly run through those legends. If I can remember them all, it was uh, Bob Bob Gordon, Scoop Vessels, Steve Kelly, Tommy Morris, Don Adams, Malcolm Smith, a checker. <laughs> I've forgotten the names. Of and did you did you have Ivan Stewart then? Yes, yes. I'm yeah, sorry. you had some top notch, top top notch. Well, correct. We didn't have Ivan completely. Uh, Ivan worked for Charlotte. Okay. And so um, when it came to Ivan, I learned this on the, I immediately went to the West Coast and had dinner with all these people, once at, one at a time, one on one. And uh, in my talk with Ivan and Linda, uh, I came to learn that, uh, that the money BFG had in their budget didn't go to Ivan, it went to Charlotte. Uh, and I thought that was kind of wrong, but I listened. And so we got to the point of the little interview with Ivan, you know, so Ivan, what would you do if you had your hand on the joystick? You could have anything you want, anything you want. He says, I'd go full race, full race, full time. I'd quit my job at Atlas Fence. I'd go full racing. So I got thinking about that. I said, you know, we don't have Ivan. We have Charlotte. Charlotte's not worth anything without Ivan. Ivan's worth a, sh a lot <laughs> without, uh, without yeah. Charlotte. Yeah. So I said, Ivan, I'll throw you an idea. You and Linda think this over and call me back. What if, what if I paid your salary for a full year, give you a year to go out and try your luck at, at going totally independent? Um, we'll see if we can make this work. If you make it in the year, great. If you don't, it's going to be back to the program you had last year. Where, where are you on that? Basically, he said, let's give it a try. Sign the deal. It was, okay, so now we own him. The following season, Cal Wells goes to, to Ivan and says, listen, I want you on my Toyota. We're gonna, Toyota's got a big program, and we want you to be our lead guy. And uh, so come on over. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, you're going to have to leave those uh, tires behind. We were at the Yokohama. No, Bridgestone. Bridgestone. <laughs> we're going Bridgestone. Jeez. And um, so... I, I kind of mentioned Ivan because Ivan wasn't as experienced at those, in those years uh, at, at the business level that he is today. Ivan, you can't go to Toyota if they're running Bridgestone. Well, why not? Well, because you're on BFG. You understand how this works? You're on BFG, and uh, we're not going to give it away to Bridgestone. Well, what do I do? I don't know. Guess you better talk it over with Cal. Cal called me. What do I got to do to get Ivan? Well, just put BFs on there. Okay, I'll get back to you. It took about a week. Bridgestone was out. We're in. Ivan's got his full-time ride. Changed his life. This is how it works. This is how it works. But this is how it works for Bauer. You see, you mentioned something about how you know, people trust me and all that. It's because, you know, I learned, came to believe. I don't know if I learned it. But I came to believe early on, if you help people, everybody else make, meet their needs, yours are going to get met. It's the Bauer hierarchy of needs scale? It, you know, it really is. Uh, I mean, it really is. And, and it may sound cliche, and it may sound like all those silly things, but doggone, um, it works. Well, that's what, you know, honestly, as I, as I dove deep into who's this guy across the room with the beard in the face that I'm going to get on the show, and I don't even know who you are, but as I <laughs> dug deep into who you are, I think that's a constant that repeats in your career at every level. You are a giver. You, yep. you give, 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 whether it's a service at a gas station when you're a kid that ends up with the widow of a guy giving you the Corvette for almost for, nothing. For dibs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for almost nothing. Um, to your your work um, with the Corvette Club, and that leads to your your BF Goodrich employment. Yeah. You you gave. You personally gave. You personally gave Southern California for Akron, Ohio. 
<laughs> you gave yourself up to this this corporate role and and you know as you grew in that role the amount that you gave to the sport and to the people and to the the employees coming to your seminars and changing their lives through them paying attention to what the information you're giving them and, and helping but you gave and gave and gave and gave and gave but it's never been a debit on my account it's it's the best way to look at it, I'm sure. <laughs> it's just an investment in theirs. Where did it come from? Is that your mom? Is that your dad? Is that just something you, you picked up along the way? Hmm. You know, Michael, I don't I don't really know. Um You know, I, I this may sound a little bizarre. I I have two sisters. I had a mom, two sisters, mom and dad are divorced. I'm growing up in a house of three women. One was a twin. And um, I kind of ended up being, if it is to be, Bob, it's up to me. <laughs> you know, kind of running my own, own deal and how to get along. You had to learn how to get along. And because I was, you know, a borderline delinquent child. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I kind of learned how to get almost in trouble and all the way out. <laughs> so just by listening. I, I've, I've, I Maybe I don't. I don't know if my mom taught me or anybody. I, I learned to listen. And if I had to think of, there's a single skill that has gotten me through my scrapes. It's not what I've said. It's what I've heard. Hmm. And, and you've said a lot, though. You you found yourself on a lot of podiums, making speeches and talking to people about stuff. So it's the listening. Well, the listening is this is the one skill no one teaches in school, and the single most important skill that anybody has. I mean, if you're going to deal with other humans just Bob's philosophy. <laughs> uh, you're also known for your opinions. Can we talk about Bob's opinions? What's it to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if, uh, you're, if you're, um, let me, let me put this delicately. Okay. If history repeats itself, you'll be running slow Baja in no time, <laughs> or at least be, <laughs> you'll be my mentor or on my board of directors helping me through this. Cause be you, you, to. you see these, you see these things, you have an opinion about how these things can be done probably better. And then you're willing to step up and say, you know what? Yep. I'll do it. Rod Hall comes to you and says, I'm not smart enough to run Orm off. Off-road Motorsports Hall of Fame wasn't the motorsports part in those days, but you know Perlman had started this thing. Yeah. Ed Perlman, we've we've talked about the Perlmans a lot. I'm going to see Mike uh, probably tomorrow or tonight uh, for the Nora. So they started the Nora Mexican 1000 back in '67 because the the florist's employee didn't know how to shift the Land Cruiser and uh, got out onto the highway and blew the motor up trying to deliver some flowers for Ed Perlman and uh, Ed being a cheapskate. Went and put a V8, dropped, went to the junkyard and dropped a Chevy V8 into his Land Cruiser and then hit the desert. And then pretty soon he's trying to set the record to, uh, from Tijuana to La Paz. And yeah. that doesn't work, but he comes up with this great idea about, hey, we should have an off-road race. Fast forward <laughs> to what we were talking about here. You have opinions. So Rod Hall comes to you and says, hey, I'm not smart enough. I got, all, I got Ed, Ed Perlman's box of ephemera for the motorsports hall of fame or the off-road racing hall of fame help me and well, you did you know i was there it was uh 1994 i'm gonna say 1994 rod put on a race the, the reno 400 he wanted to create on his own race and and he did uh and he invited up there uh to, to be his race steward a fellow named jack brady jack was one of ed's um folks it was a race steward back in the back in the day along with him came ed and that white uh cardboard box and in the box the hall the hall of fame was in that box one box yeah and it was uh, so they, they we were up in one of the rooms and we opened the box and looked at stuff like that and and rod and i had been good friends for years already and so you know you get to know a guy a little bit you know and i saw the look on his face was total bewilderment totally bewildered oh my god he says i know this is a treasure i mean you can see he knew it was onto something but now what and uh so we talked and he ended up getting attorneys involved accountants involved formed it into a 501c3 corporation got it got it cleaned up to be presentable 
And then we went about the task of structuring it. Uh, and I was able to do a lot of that with a lot of help from a lot of people, frankly. It wasn't just a Bauer stuff. Other people helped me a lot. And we gave it a launch in 2003. And so when, when you say opinions, sometimes it's just like, I have an opinion about how this should see or feel or taste or, or look, how it should feel. And um, when it came to the Hall of Fame, one of the things that I put on the table right away with Rod is, is that, you know, this is, if we're gonna do this, it's gotta be a legit deal. It's not gonna be an old boys club. It's not gonna, you're not gonna allow to pick up your pals and put them where you want them. It has to have ethic or I'm out. And uh, he never squabbled about that, you know, so that's how we carried forth. And um, the only thing I was able to say to people when I would run my little fundraisers, I'd like for the Mexican 1000, my, Mike Perlman let me run a little deal there where um, I went to the Mexican 1000 in 2012 or 13. And everybody say, you know, Hall of Fame needs a little bit of help. Your phrase for it is buy me a taco. My phrase was, how about you pledge a little something per mile you make the race? You go the whole distance, you spend a little money. What are the pledges? Are they, what, 10, 20, 30 bucks? No, I said, you can't have a nickel. You can have a dime, quarter. If you want more, that's, that's up to you. And so the guy said, well, you know, wait a minute. And, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's amazing what people will do if they think it's affordable. So you tell, them, you tell them 25 cents a mile. How bad could that hurt? The guy makes it 1,000 miles. Well, thank you. <laughs> you get 30 of those people together to do it. So if you spread it out a bunch, a bunch of people who all are involved in their own success, uh, success happens for more of us. So that's, that's what I mean by an opinion. Here's, let's do something. It's, not, it's a little outrageous maybe, but it's got to be ethical, got to be fair, uh, got to be repeatable. That was it. Yeah, but you did it. You stepped up and did it. Well, Rod Hall did a lot in his career, an awful lot. Yes, he did. Amazingly successful driver, pretty successful human, all that business family. He he saw, he saw the guy. Maybe he saw well, the mark or the sucker or I don't what, know. But but you stepped up and did it is what I'm getting to. Well, what he I know what he I know what he heard. I don't know what he saw. I know what he heard, and and this is maybe part of the opinions things that you're you're yeah. searching for, is that. Between the time Ed put that thing back into a box, which is about 1970, no, 80-something, 80, 80, I think it was. My years are probably wrong, but forgive me. Nothing happened to the Hall of Fame. Plenty happened to off-road racing, off-roading as a general. So uh, when we structured the thing, it wasn't going to be off-road racing only. It had to be for all four-wheelers, recreational, Otherwise, uh, rock crawling, I put categories in there that weren't yet mature, but I knew in 15 years they'd earn their spot. Um, and it had to be inclusive. So I've lost my place. I know it's changing. I was so headed for uh Yeah, well, you are just telling me opinions. that someday there's going to be a slow Baja category. Yes. Because <laughs> it's not just for racing. We're going to take a break right here. We're going to have a word from our sponsors, Baja Bound. I'm Baja Bound today. And I can't wait to swing by uh, Jeff's house, pick up a whole big bag of lip balm. So everybody's going to have nice, safe lips for our trip. And uh, we'll be right back with Bob Bauer. Here at Slow Baja, we can't wait to drive our old Land Cruiser south of the border. And when we go, we'll be going with Baja Bound Insurance. Their website's fast and easy to use. Check them out at BajaBound.com. That's BajaBound.com, serving Mexico travelers since 1994. Big thanks to my new sponsor, Nomad Wheels. They stepped up and sponsored the Slow Baja Safari Class at the Nora Mexican 1000. And I don't know if you've seen the pictures, but Slow Baja is running a set of 501 convoys in utility gray, and they look pretty damn sharp. They were a little shiny. I will admit that they were a little shiny when uh, I got them installed at Basil's Garage just before the Nora Mexican 1000. But after, I don't know, 3,800 miles of Baja dirt, they look perfect. They really do. Nomad wheels.com that's right check them out reflecting a minimalist approach to off-road travel nomadwheels.com the bauer report <laughs> you're the bauer group right but but i'm not schizophrenic and neither am i so <laughs> <laughs> are we back 
Hey, we're back with Bob Bauer of the Bauer Group. We've got to stop smiling. <laughs> well, um, we've had such a, a fun, um, uh, lively, uh, disjointed <laughs> conversation. There's a there's a, a point that um, we we didn't get the answer, oh. and inquiring minds want to know, Bob. All right. We got Bobby Spears. Yes, yes. We heard a little bit about Bill Strop. Yes. We did not hear about how Seize Candy became <laughs> the greatest off-road pit strategy in the world how did you how did you take these things and assimilate it into what you did for the bfg pits you did work for people who don't know you worked for bf goodrich i did i worked from for bf goodrich from 1976 until my uh last day in 1994. and just to to summarize here you got there because you're a corvette guy yeah and you're doing some <clears throat> fun corvette stuff and you became an officer in the western states corvette club back when people had clubs before everybody was just on the internet yeah, talking well, this to themselves. this is a council of clubs. I mean, this right. is like and you ascended, oh, yeah. you ascended <laughs> to the highest mountain of the Corvette scallywags. Yeah. And, and you got to go to places like Wichita and other, other places. You mentioned Wichita. That's where I asked the, the core question of, of, I met the BFG guy. Uh, who's, you know, they're over there helping those Corvettes out. And so I was a guest. And I wanted to meet the BFG fees, people because I had, I had some ideas. Opinions. Opinions, I did. And, and um, one of them came out in the form of a question for, for the BFG guy. His name was Gary, uh, Gary Pace. And I said, how would you feel about getting linked up with a group of Corvette people who set all the trends that these people you're paying are following? The West Coast guys. The West Coast guys. The cool kids. Well, we you were. You want to say that. Yeah. And so, you know, he gave me that what you talking about Willis look, <laughs> and we sat down. And it ended up with him taking an airplane flight out to California. I came to learn it's the first time he'd ever been west of Denver in his life. He was so animated when he got off the airplane. Michael, he was coming off the airplane. He says, Bob, Bob, Bob. He says, you know, he says, we were in the air for the last 45 minutes over the city. We never changed directions. Yeah. He's from Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> we saw some lights and some streets. Some, it just kept going and going. Well, anyway, so... The pit strategy that, that was amazing was Seize Candy. I eventually got in charge of the off-road race program. and So you got hired by Goodrich. You moved up into, you had to move to Akron. Yeah. And yeah, somehow they said, you know what, hey, send this guy out to uh, the desert. And uh, now we're getting to Seize Candy. Now we're getting to Seize Candy. Well, you guys don't have any money, which is an, a big secret. You look like a big dog, but it's the mid-70s. There's some malaise going on. There's some issues with uh, fuel and money and business. And now you know, you're trying to make chicken salad out of chicken uh, Harvard squat, MBAs my dad would says. be aghast if yes. they saw our marketing plan. And written right in it was, by use of smoke and mirrors. <laughs> um, those are the words, Michael. I wrote them. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so we were not very big. We just had the appearance of being very big. But we couldn't, you know, we, we couldn't write a big check because our mouth, even though our mouth still was promising that. So um, I get in charge of the program. I'd already learned over the five years prior by going to races how important pitting was. And then I saw the, the situation, because I never really studied the BFG side of it because it was never my issue, my problem, my job. It was now. And I said, you know, we can do an awful lot in, in, in pitting here if we try. So I, I started off using every race we had. There were six of them that year as a rehearsal for the Baja 1000. It was, everything was focused on the Baja 1000. Um, and so we, we gave our tractor trailer guys, you know, pit anybody, anybody comes in and needs help. I don't care if they're on X, Y, Z tires, help them, give them what they need. And this is Frank D'Angelo, right? Yeah. Frank was my track driver, uh, tractor trailer driver at the time. Um, and, um, he was tuned into that. And so I, I told him, even Michael, if you are driving along the highway and, and see somebody stopped along, stop, you know, you got oil, give them oil. It's, it's, it's smart. Plus, it's the C's candy. It's the sample. Well, when they come into the pits and they're on someone else's stuff and they come in and they get fed and their car gets fixed, even almost washed, you know, we clean off the numbers that that leaves a mark. And so if they're going to be paying 120 bucks, or 150 bucks a tire from XYZ company, might as well pay it to somebody who's going to pay it back. You see, because the racers, I knew when pitting was important um, because it's, it's my, my meetings told me in January they all wanted more money. 
oh, it's, you think that's pretty logical. You, you know, the sponsor Everybody. guy shows up. Yeah. He says, you know, you're give gonna, me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. You got money. I don't. I need you to give me your money. And tires. Yeah, and tires. And swag. And we're gonna. They're gonna make us famous. That's the other. Yeah, you know, we're gonna put the ones. sticker on. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, I knew that if I could get guys to just come in the pits and figure out what it was, they'd come back. And that was the Seize Candy approach. You don't go into a Seize Candy store ever without getting a free sample before you even order. And that's kind of how I looked at it. It's simple. I mean, I, I couldn't afford to buy, advertise, whatever you do, word of mouth was it. And, and if I could convert racers to customers by doing something as outrageous as being nice, let me think, how often do I want to do this? And being nice is free. It's free. Smiles don't cost a thing. They don't cost a thing. Treat them with respect. It's amazing. And, and, it, and, it, and it worked. It worked. The mapping stuff didn't come till way later, though, Michael. We're going to get into that. All right. Um, you know, I have, um, I have a sponsor who's just come back. I love him dearly. Benchmark Maps, they yes. make this beautiful 72-page Baja Road and Recreation Atlas. But before things like that existed, some guy like you said, you know what, we need to have all this mapped out so people know where the hell they're going, know, can figure out how long it might take to get there. Yeah, yeah. So maybe they can quit doing some stupid stuff on the road. So take, take, break that up. Well, you, you saw, you saw yeah. this pressing need and there wasn't a what were you were you using like triple a club maps or what what <laughs> illegally yes. yeah but well yes I, I i had gotten really lost in the 80 i don't know five or six by a thousand I, they get kind of scrambled after a while but um i was with mike randall we're in the jeep honcho and um we <laughs> we came around a turn it all started by a, a one racer just snapping his lights on at us he had gone into a ditch backwards. His headlights were facing down course as we were coming up. And he was waiting for cars to come around the turn to flick on all his lights so that car would stop and pull him out. It's a pretty stupid way of doing it, in my opinion. I do have opinions. And I told him so. And so we left. You're still in the ditch, dude. That's, that's just bad. Because now we had the, Michael, we had these big white yeah, balls in our eyes. Can't see a damn thing. Can't Your see eye, a dark balls have been burned. They have been. Yeah. And, um, so we took off. What we didn't know is we couldn't see. And we took off in the wrong direction. And we were making great time. Come on. <laughs> Can't make this up. This doesn't happen on a track uh, weekend at the track. No, no. And, and by and by, you know, Mike and I, we realized, well, I realized first, we're kind of lost. I said, I'm not sure, you know, I'm looking around, I'm not sure where we are. And, and at that time, you're using every sense that you can muster, smell included. I you got your salt. sex to not. Yeah. yeah, I smell salt. Okay, so we're going to come to something probably flat, like a beach, or at least close. And then I see it. I said, oh, there it is, white hard pack right out there. Mike, go. We're a four-wheel drive Jeep poncho with, you know, big old 406. <laughs> got all the way out on that salt crust <laughs> over the mud bog, <laughs> the salt, <laughs> the, the coastal yeah. thing there. The mud flats. <laughs> Stuck. All four. Took him two days to find us. Nisha, uh, my wife, was not enchanted, and I, uh, I was made to understand that. <laughs> so I swore I'd never be lost again in Baja, ever, like that. And so I started begging pre-runs uh, from guys. Guys are going down, because um, I was a private pilot, I had a little understanding of the, the navigation ways you use there, and they have whack charts, and you know, sectional charts and things like that. I knew how to read that were very accurate for very good stuff and the Auto Club map. Between the two of those, I could go down there and keep track of exactly where I was, knowing what it was. And I would start, logging, you know, K173, there's this road that goes into Trace Hermanos and you know, like that. It started bit by bit and over a couple of years, it got to be pretty comprehensive. Uh, so I started making extra copies and kind of slipping to it. A friend. I didn't care if he was on Yokohama. I don't care. This guy needs help. And he's a one-man team. He's got the race car and one chase guy. So, um, but I realized at a point, because people liked the map so much and they did so much good, the chase crews were going crazy for him because they, they knew now it's going to take me an hour 
as opposed to I don't know how long I have, I better get to it, you know, I better speed. Um, I finally turned all the masters and all the stuff over to BFG to incorporate into their pitting situation because they had budget and interest and I couldn't do it anymore on the scale they wanted it done, you know, because I had to hand color every map, <laughs> right, every circle. <laughs> well, <clears throat> let's, let's touch on you were in the right seat of this G poncho. Yeah. And um, somehow through your work, somebody convinced you, you'd done some driving with your Corvette, I'm assuming. Yes, yes. But somebody had said, hey, let's get the BF Goodrich guy into the right seat. That's going to be tires. That's going to be corporate money. If we can just get this guy, if we can just reel this dude in, yep, uh, we've got it made. And so you took your your approach, your acumen to the right seat, and you, I, in my opinion, went from being a cheerleader to being a referee or a regulator, <laughs> and and tried to um, get guys to calm down and go slower so that they could win the rides while i had the job of being uh the program manager or whatever they called us they called us a lot of things um i would refuse to get in a race car no matter who it was for any reason because exactly as you describe that is no doubt the motivation for them saying hey let's put the bf guy in the race car and so uh, I had that job only for one season. And then I, I moved on to an admin job in Southern California so I could be uh, actually closer to my mom. She was alone here. And you, you fill in the blanks for yourself. Yeah, you don't have to make excuses for Akron. <laughs> my, my dad graduated from Akron U, and seven days later he was in California. It took him seven days to drive. <laughs> so there's a great place to be from. I have fond feelings for Akron, very fond. Yeah, I've been there many, many times. Good stuff. That's Akron's a good nice place. Nice people. They, they really are. Nice people. Um, so anyway, so they did the maps and more people got to them and they, and they saved stuff. And uh, me getting in the right seat happened after I was in charge of the program. I wouldn't compromise so you, uh, like that. And, and it happened almost serendipitously. Uh, I was attending races on my own anyway. And so Mike Randall or Johnny Randall, I can't remember which of the Randalls, but it was the Randall clan said, hey, Bob, uh, you want to go for a ride during, during practice? Now I can. So we did, and he commented at the end of the thing, he said, wow, you know, you, you, uh, you're not like most people who get into the truck the first time. That's, and, and eventually that turned into an invitation to ride with him in the desert. And as a result, uh, because the Randalls were pretty notorious for going like 60 for the first half hour, and then they break. So really fast, but not really finishers until we started finishing. And they kind of credited me for giving them the, the motivation inside the cockpit to do, to do that. And I started forming more opinions um, after I got to realizing from sitting in the right seat of a race car, knowing what it's like sitting in a pit, knowing what it's like doing a chase, knowing what it's like to be the program manager, all these various uh, views on the same little knob. Um, I said, you know, done well, done correctly. I believe the right seat can win two races a year for the left seat. It's like a catcher and a pitcher. Yeah. Again, we were talking about you being in the right seat, and you had said um, being in the right seat, you thought you could you could uh, pick up a couple wins a season by being prepared and, and doing taking the approach that you, you took. And I, I want to read a quote from your old teammate and your friend. We were talking about Ivan Stewart earlier. Uh-huh. So this is a quote from uh, Ivan Stewart. Um Ivan Stewart said, I, would, I wouldn't ride with Robbie, meaning Robbie Gordon. I wouldn't ride with Robbie if you paid me. I really like Robbie, and I think he's truly a great driver, but I wouldn't ride with him. He's still too young, a little too enthusiastic in front of a crowd. I like riding with older drivers who have nothing to prove. You rode with Robbie Gordon a lot. Yeah. Can you Ivan won't ride with Linda either, so come on. <laughs> Can you get into that? Tell me how, tell us how, how you were approached to, to tame the monster of Robbie Gordon. Now, again, he had Bob Gordon. He had a pretty damn good example of what to do. True. And, and pick it up. 
Robbie was a phenomenon from the very get-go. I mean, he, he started out with a lot of press, which for an, an 18-year-old kid could really kick your rudder in the wrong direction, is my opinion. And to a degree, it, it seems to have done that with Robbie while they were watching. And uh, uh, he'd have his friends sitting in the, in the right seat. And they were cheerleaders. You know, fly it, Robbie. Fly it. Oh, dude. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that guy needs no encouragement to fly it. No, he doesn't. And, and if anything, you know, he, Robbie somehow after he and I spent some time together saw the merits of keeping it out of the air. You can't, you can't turn, stop, or go. Uh, in the air you have to be connected to the planet and so he'd save his buggy hops and crazy shit for crowds but man when we got away from the crowd it was back down on that desert floor digging 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 so when you get in with Robbie it, 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 he's young he was young he was brash he was all those things that Ivan says he really was and talented and incredibly talented and you're what 45-ish oh, years age old? age-wise? Uh, yeah, somewhere. You're mature. You could be his dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he needed one sometimes. Yeah, all right, so pick it up. Uh, so so you get in with, with Robbie, and um, we started making friends in, on the pre-run together. He, he, would, he would be Robbie, and, and I would be Bob. And it finally came to the point where I was going to let him go ahead and be Robbie without Bob. Uh, on the pre-runs all we had was a lap belt jesus and and, and are you I, in that you're in this is the hay hauler era what are you well this is hay hauler era so like correct late but 80s there was an earlier hay hay hauler jim jacobus's pickup which is okay. an early ford pickup high beam car uh builds a race car but it was now robbie's pre-runner lap belts lap with belts. robbie lap belts with robbie flying flying and and uh Pi- private pilot with no license <laughs> you know those two words God, they're amazing what they do, how they can stir your emotions. Watch this. <laughs> well, so there was a lot, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on uh, getting in the car with Robbie. Not to mention, uh, too, too strongly, Robbie didn't pick me. Hmm. He's now a Ford driver, factory Ford driver, Ford BFG. And um, it was probably in his early days learning about, you know, when you have sponsorship, you don't have autonomy or you're now owned hello that's the deal he was getting used to that so he had i think a fair amount of uh skepticism i don't know about distrust or whatever but it it wasn't a positive kumbaya Mm -hmm. deal especially after i bailed on the pre-runs you were like the vice principal or something having to sit in with the delinquent (laughs) yeah i'm gonna sit right my switch i'm gonna (laughs) sit right here until you get this right well i'm sure that he expected well i'm not sure it would be hard to not imagine him expecting that this co-driver's going to come in and tell me how to do my race truck. Bullshit. It ain't going to happen. Well, I was a little smarter than that. Um, I have opinions. The guy driving the car is in charge. He is the pilot in command. Period. Whether it's Robbie or I don't care who. Therefore, he's in charge. So it never made sense to me, to any of the volatile drivers that I'd ever been with, to say, slow down. Stop! Oh, oh, it's you, dummy! Or, or I hear stories back like, whacking the guy, whacking the driver. Uh, Bill Strop, Parnelli Jones. Well, in that case, I can see what Strop had in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, it's Strop. <laughs> it's Strop, and uh, but you don't do that, Michael. He's in charge of the thing, and as we started running, you know, pretty soon he started listening to me. I was never telling him anything to do. When we'd get a little froggy, you know, you're, you're maybe just coming off the bump stops a little bit, you're playing a little bit, I can save it like this. You, you can tell we're on, the, we're on the edge. And you learn a sense from the right seat is how far ahead of this truck is his driver. And you're measuring his mind, watching his feet. You just did a lot of, you're busy. So it's on the edge. Well, rather than say slow down, that's like ordering the guy around. He's in charge. So, so Robbie, how long can the truck do this? Is this, is this an all-day thing? You shut up. Pretty soon, we lose about 300 hours. We're back down digging. There's another time that I know 
a guy at his attention. We're on the radio. It was, uh, I believe, a Nevada 500 in 90 or so, 89. You're fresh in the relationship with him. You started in First 89, year. yeah? Did Pardon? you start Did you start with, with Robbie in 89? 89, 88. 88, so you're, it's a new relationship. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's new, and he's still, well, like any two guys in a race car do, you, you, you gotta learn each other. You have to learn to trust each other or get away from each other. In car marriage. In car marriage. And all right, go ahead, pick it up. It's true, what, stay, what goes in the car stays in the car, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Nevada 500, we're, we're running for the overall. We're, we're lickety split, and we've got a pretty good, pretty good gap on the guys behind. Over the radio comes a warning. It's a guy named um, Stutz, Dan Stutz from Ford. And he's on the radio to Rob. He said, Robbie, Rob, you got to slow down. You got to slow down. Your, your, your times are too quick. You're going too fast through that section. We can't have you do this. You're going to break the truck. So I kind of looking around and say, well, Robbie, I said, you know, you're not on the bump stops. You're not playing. I can save it. You're having fun. You can tell because he's got his foot up on the dead pedal. <laughs> he's, he's, he's Robbie in it through here. <laughs> and uh, God, talent. Screw him. <laughs> Stutz is an idiot. He's not in the race car. You are. Yeah. How's your race car, Robbie? I asked. I, I never told a, a driver anything. I always ask questions. Ask questions. Open-ended questions. There is a little science to it. Who, what, where, when, why, how. And they command an answer more often than not. And if you can command an answer out of a race driver, you've caused him to think. And if you cause him to think with a smart question, you've caused him to think what you want him to think. Without telling him without telling him you've worked them all the way around in your mind to the answer that you want you're like a you're like a basset hound getting that rabbit right in front of the hunter i'm a dad i'm a dad <laughs> diabolical dad <laughs> but that worked with a lot of drivers frankly uh I, I i came to believe that that's is the correct philosophy at least for the combination of me in the cockpit with somebody and My, that was your secret sauce well the secret sauce was consistently Driver knows they have my respect. Driver knows I'm paying very, very close attention to him. When I started asking them about their brake problems, and he's been trying to hide it, because I can see what's going on with the feet. I'm no virgin. <laughs> you know, and, and I believe that the feedback I've received from drivers that I've been with is that that's a very comforting thing when they realize that they're not only not alone, but they're in there with a partner. Robbie was asked in an interview, <clears throat> pardon me, after some race, Gold Coast race, I think. Press guy gets, says, Robbie, why do, you, why do you have this guy Bauer in the racetrack? He's not media. He's not a mechanic. He doesn't own anything. Is he paying you? And Robbie says, yeah, best compliment, actually, Michael, I think I've ever, ever received. He says, listen, he says, Bauer is over there racing his side of the truck just as fast as I'm racing mine. Wow. And I, and I said, well, shut up, leave, take the win. But that's how drivers, I think, felt with me, according to what they say. Uh, and then, you know, after a certain point, the right seat stuff became, um, people will go out and say, go get Bauer. Put your guy in with Bauer. He'll, he'll teach them. He'll mentor them. He'll, he'll whatever. And at first, I thought that was like kind of a come down. Until I realized, no, it's really the other way around. It's a privilege. Yeah, and can you uh, can you break down what that? I mean, with GoPros and everything else, people have been inside race cars now. Like yeah. When you were doing it, you didn't get to go to YouTube and say, "Well, what are these legends doing? How do I, how am I supposed to do this job?" You figured it out. You made it work, and yeah. you you were very successful at it. And as you said, probably on your side, as, as Robbie said. You're racing just as fast as he is over there. Can you just put us in that seat and tell us what uh, a navigator, co-driver, what your responsibilities are, what you say, what you don't say, what happens? You know, you have to change the tire, right? Like a tire goes back. We the have driver, to change the tire. We, okay. Yeah, so just, just tell us about how, for folks who, you know, listen, for folks who have no idea what the navigator does. Navigator does different things in different situations. You know, my recipe or, or my activities aren't going to be the same as his activities with that driver. 
so I, I don't mean to describe here's how it's got to was. You know, it's, it's, here's Bob's process. And Bob's process starts probably about half an hour before we ever get to the start line uh, while we're in a racetrack. I mean, it starts earlier because there's all sorts of relationship things that go on before the race. But in the race car, I'm doing things on purpose that maybe don't matter. Maybe I'm just kidding myself. First thing I do is I'm keeping a conversation going on, relax, quiet, low tones, low energy, no hype. Keep my guy, keep his, keep his pulse at 50. Don't get him excited, don't get him distracted. Talk about the race course, talk about the day, talk about the assets, um, how you feeling. Watch him carefully. I remember one driver, I, <laughs> he had that wheel. We were still on the grid. Ah, knuckles were white. I said, I said, was it no? I, I won't use names. I said, look at what your hands are doing with that wheel. You won't last 10 minutes that way. Let's get your thumbs and let's do that kind of stuff. So my process always starts with uh, what's going on between their ears. So then you, you're coming up to the line. When you're three cars back, it's all business. Then it's just monosyllable answers, uh, smart questions, no extra talk, no extra talk needed whatsoever. You know, wisecracks, comments, the chicky boom boom over there with a nice, no, nah. like that. And he knows it. You take off. Um, I look for a reason to praise my driver as early as I can for, for a reason, not false, for a reason. Fortunately, you know, in the first 30 minutes of a race, especially the Baja 1000, I don't believe that there's a more intense onrush of input. And you know you have to select the three things that are output that are going to get you through <laughs> and seven that are going to whack you. So in a race car, you're doing the first half hour, you look for praise. Then you start analyzing what's going on and start talking stuff. If it's a driver who wants turns called like we have now with GPS, you can call turns ahead of time. You say, you know, and I use a system in the GPS that I use range rings. I don't know if this matters to your listeners, but I, I use range rings on the GPS. I set it at about uh, half a mile, th six tenths. So the range rings come down and I know that one ring is, is uh, roughly two tenths of a mile away, a quarter mile away. So I, the cursor comes through there. I said, obstacle, two tenths. We know, or, or do tenths, we got a 45 right or right 45, however they like to hear it. And pretty soon you get into a, a cadence where they don't even have to understand they know if he's going a quarter mile out, then I'm going to run halfway to it, coming up on it, clear. Boom, 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 clear every time. The co-driver makes that a habit so that, I said it before, but I mean it's even when you can't understand what I'm saying. I was with Reed Rutherford in his 7200 car, his little Ecotec motor. Just, I mean, you can't hear yourself think, much less intercom. But, but Reed knew because of the cadence. So that's where you start doing things as a co-driver where you, you are partnering up and helping that, that driver. The stories about changing tires and diagnosing this and everything else, um, come, I, this is opinion, more often come from the teams that don't have it organized in the cockpit. They're fixing things after they break. I believe what I'm trying to do is keep them from breaking to begin with. Let's keep rolling. You're only, you're only good while you're rolling forward. That's pretty profound, Bob, and we're going to leave it right there, man. Wow. You're only one more time? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wow. Bob Bauer, what a delight. Thank you so much for opening your home and your house and telling all the neighbors to stop with their gardening <laughs> yeah. and for this period for Slow Baja. And, and just to, to close it up here, um, I do think you mean it. I do think you mean it when you say it. you're not just trying to flatter me, but going slow is, is the way to see Baja. Oh, yes. Absolutely. I, uh, <laughs> there's, or, there's stories about things that happen at speed and how I feel about it and what I said about it and else. But... You know, your first couple of trips down there for a motorsport event, you, you feel racy, so you act racy. But then when you come down and you get to meet who the Baja people are, and the further south you go, the more gracious and the kinder they are. I've often believed, after being down there for 40 plus, you know, 
our, our neighbors down south could sure teach us gringos a thing or two about how to bring up children and how to treat our elders and you know how to keep cam, uh, community together and keep the family together uh, going at 40 miles an hour matters it, it does you can smell it you certainly can we're going to keep uh, a few questions for the next time we meet okay. um, there's a, still a lot to talk about and i really appreciate it again we got to get down the road i've got five more stops between here and Ensenada and we're off to the Nora tonight so I really appreciate you making some time so thank you. It's, it's actually been my pleasure. Thank you for finding me. I appreciate <laughs> that too. It was the mustache and the beard and the twinkle in your eye. <laughs> Alright, thanks Bob. You're welcome. Hey, well I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Bob Bauer. What an amazing dude. Really, an amazing human being. That glint in his eye is legit. And do take a second. You know, it's right now. It's the Baja 1000 time. A lot of people are heading down to uh, to chase the race. And take a minute. Read that. What about you? I got to tell you. I hope it. Uh, I hope it changes somebody's behavior and saves a life. I really do. All right. Well, enough about that. Uh, if you like what I'm doing here, if you like what I'm doing, and it's November and you're listening all year, and you wish there were more episodes, take a second. Drop a taco in the tank. Really. You know, I can't do this show without you, folks. Really, I can't. Reach in, reach in deep, hit that donate link, uh, drop a taco in the tank and help me keep uh, this show on the road, meeting people in their homes, meeting people uh, in Baja. Um, I was just at the Chenneth Lodge, sat down right at the table that I interviewed uh, Johnny Johnson at. And of course, he's not there anymore. And it just made me um, happy that I spent that time, that I got that interview. Uh, And if you're happy that I'm doing that stuff, really take a second. Um, drop a taco in the tank. If you don't have any tacos, I get it. I do not have any tacos in my tank at the moment. Um, but uh, hit that five-star review on Apple or Spotify. Say something nice about why you're still listening uh, to the show 100 and something episodes later. And uh, share the show with a friend. Send it along to somebody you know loves Baja and uh, tell them why you're still uh, you're still spending this time with me. Um, got some great new stuff in the shop, including canvas shopping bag. I made some really nice canvas shopping bags for the Slow Baja Vintage Expedition. I made some extras because I thought people might want to have one here. It's going into the holidays. It's got a zipper. You can put your stuff in it, take it to the beach, throw it in the sand, zip it up. Nobody's going to mess with it. Um, it's got a zipper pocket inside the zippered top. So it's double security. Throw your keys in there. Throw your phone in there. Throw your wallet in there. What? Ever is important to you, throw it in the inside pocket, zip it up, and then zip up the outside. Man alive, who's thinking like that for you? It's Slow Baja approved. Check it out, Slow Baja canvas shopping bag at the Slow Baja shop. All right, enough about that. I'll be back with something fun before you know it. And to uh, tell you about Off-Road Motorsports Hall of Famer Mary McGee's pal Steve McQueen, you know, he loved Baja. Steve McQueen did. He said, Baja is life. Anything that happens before or after is just waiting.